Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, and joining me, my favorite Texans writer, Rivers McCown, who's formerly of Football Outsiders, when Football Outsiders existed, NBC Sports Edge, RiversMcCown.com, where he mused for many years about the struggling Houston Texans, and now, Rivers, you get to write about the wonderful Houston Texans that are the darling of the NFL ball during this offseason. And uh, I would have brought you on to talk ball with you anytime because you are one of my favorite football writers. But it just so happens that there is this intersection now between the Minnesota Vikings and the Houston Texans that none of us saw coming. So uh, first of all, how, how are we feeling about the Houston Texans, man? Uh, to go into the playoffs last year, C.J. Stroud, after climbing through miles and miles of uh, not good football to emerge like Shawshank Redemption, I'd say it's got to be it's got to be fun. Cover the Texans now. They they pick six uh, Joe Flacco twice in that first playoff game, and the second time I threw my kid up in the air. My kid is now eight months old. Back then, you can do the math, like four or five months old, uh, and uh, he cried. He cried really hard, and that was that was very funny. <laughs> it's something I'm going to rub in his face when he grows up, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this has been wild. It's been it's it, it's interesting to watch kind of how that Texans writer sphere has grown as I've been kind of more detached doing that stuff this year. Um, and, and yeah, C.J. Stroud is. <laughs> he, I mean, you, you, even when we had Deshaun Watson, that was, you know, a different kind of interesting, a different kind of amazing when he was still, you know, somebody you wanted to feel good about. <laughs> um, uh, but, but CJ just, he's got so much, uh, so much awareness of everything. It's, it's preternatural. It's really fun. Yeah. And I, I think also, um, just from a Vikings perspective, if I'm tying it in, it sort of shows you how hard it is for, the world to figure out which quarterbacks are good because now when we have a little sample size of one year, every single person in the world would pick CJ Stroud number one overall. And he ends up falling into the Texans lap. Not that he wasn't a great prospect to go number two, but the gap was so crazy between him and uh, Bryce young last year. And one of the things that I found funny was the rumors that uh, the Texans ownership wanted to draft Stroud and that they were sort of forcing their hand to draft CJ Stroud. And there was the same story in Carolina, but that blew up, but not so much in Houston that that was a rumor because Stroud became so good. And I, I want to know from you just watching him and then we'll get into these Vikings connections. Like what, what is it with the guy? I mean, what, what is it that in your mind made him so special so fast because as the Vikings embark on potentially drafting a quarterback, uh, th this, this is like the dream scenario is that your quarterback comes in and there's no debate about it after about six weeks that this guy is the franchise quarterback going forward. So I would say what makes him special? Um, what makes him special is the first couple of weeks of the season, he was getting sacked a lot. He was getting, he had like, I think, eight sacks against the Colts or something like that in week two. He had five against the Ravens in week one. And, you know, everybody was like, oh, well, you know, it's another rebuilding season. It's an offensive line that, uh, you know, it's still coming together and we don't really have all the tools yet. And and then C.J. Stroud between week two and week three was like, you know what, sacks, I don't, I don't really need that anymore. I'm, I'm just going to eliminate that from my life, uh, just, you know. Just, I just thought about it and it's going to happen. And, you know, we already had the kind of, you know, great ability to be accurate to every side of the field. We already had kind of some vision that we, we could see working with him where, okay, you know, he's going to get to his third read. He's going to get to his fourth read. He's already figured out, you know, the safety play game and then he just decided, no, no, no more sacks. And then from there, it was just a rocket ship up. And it did seem like uh, Bobby Slowick specifically set him up for success. And that's another thing that I've been thinking about a lot with these young quarterbacks. Not that I think Stroud would have struggled really anywhere, um, maybe except for Carolina because the team was just so bad. The offense didn't fit a young quarterback. They had no receivers, no line. So I I'm being patient with Bryce Young, uh, by the way, because I think that they were in a, a very tough spot. But are we talking about Adam Thielen here? 
Are we talking on Adam Thielen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. How, how dare I say they had no receivers when they had uh, Adam Thielen? I apologize to the folks in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, where he's from. But uh, let's be honest. I mean, that was somebody the Vikings moved on from to bring in Jordan Addison. So in comparison, you know, Nico Collins, Tank Dell steps in right away. Uh, Robert Woods, a, a quality player. Dalton Schultz becomes a quality player. But I think more more than anything, uh, that the play action stuff, the bootleg stuff, it just seemed like they gave him a lot to work with in year one, which I think is really, really important from the offensive staff to understand where that quarterback is and bringing him along. The most interesting thing about Bobby Slowick is even from, you know, week one, you know, week, week one and two especially, but then as, as Stroud got better too, you started to hear the chorus, people like, Oh yeah, they run the ball way too much, man. They should just pass it. And, and you know, it's clear that you know <laughs> there there are a lot of fans that just watch the the box scores. Who just you know they see a couple of quarters and they they make their judgment on it. And I think Slowick was very intentional in the way that even though the run game wasn't working, he kind of stuck with it and uh, built on it. And all of a sudden, you had. Xavier Hutchinson taking sweeps or, or you know, end rounds. You had John Mechie kind of being extension of a running game on a screenplay. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but after watching what the Texans did with Pep Hamilton and Tim Kelly the last two years, it was it was a big breath of fresh air. And, you know, Bobby got, what was it, three or four head coach interviews. Uh, I'm just very glad that he decided to stay because this is, you know, this kind of sets up and feels like a pretty special infrastructure already. And now it's just kind of finding that finishing piece. Well, and I think the Vikings in signing Aaron Jones understand that if you're going to have success with young quarterbacks, you do have to build off the run game that I know we sound anti-analytical in in saying it, Rivers, you're a football outsiders guy, and I've always been a a fan of the analytics, but I, I think that what we can't ignore is how much easier your life is as a quarterback when you can get to second and four or when you can set up with play action. I thought Stroud working off of play action was just great. And and like, look, Shanahan and Kubiak stuff's going to work forever, man. We're going to be 87 years old doing podcasts. And I was like, Rivers, they're still running the boots. Like, I just feel like it's always going to work. And it's something that Kevin O'Connell, I think, has to understand as well, is how to, how to build that in. So I'm very excited to see where this team goes, but now they're in a position to do what every team dreams to do. You have your quarterback and now you start to spend some of that owner's money. And one of the ways they did it was by signing Daniil Hunter. So let's start there and we'll run through all the uh, now connections between the, the Vikings and Texans. The decision to let Jonathan Grenard go and sign Daniil Hunter from a Houston perspective. What did you think of that? I was not surprised to let John Grenard walk. I felt like that was been, you know, kind of whispered about in in in, in the tunnels and whatnot. Like he's a very he, he turned in a very good season, but he's not Nick Casario's ideal body type, first of all. And second of all, I think the way his body is, he may be maxed out already as far as what he can provide. You're not going to get like an extra step from him. I'm not saying he's bad. He's clearly very good. He'd had a great season. But I don't think there's like a next step for him. I think kind of what the Vikings were hoping out of their signing is, okay, well, he's going to be a passable number one edge rusher. Maybe on a great team, he's a number two. And that's still worth a lot of money for however many years it is. Whereas the Texans, I think Nick Casario uh, definitely values not having guys on long-term contracts if he can avoid it. He's, he's very – not for long about his contract decisions. And even though they gave out a huge amount of guaranteed money to Hunter, uh, I mean, Neil Hunter can hit, you know, hit the streets in two years and they're fine. So I think that's kind of more of a deal type that he prefers. And I think that's kind of interesting how the two flipped and and kind of where it reveals about where these two teams are right now. Right. And the the Texans are very much into 
win now and win for the entire rookie quarterback contract for CJ Stroud and then figure it all out later. Uh, But I think the Vikings were in a position where if you were signing an older Daniel Hunter to a two-year contract that's almost completely guaranteed, that would not have really fit exactly with their timeline. I think that a four-year deal for Jonathan Grenard was probably better for them that takes him through the second half of his prime or just coming into his prime and, and all the way through uh, around the age 30 or maybe beyond that. Um, but I, on the point about Grenard, I'm curious about his kind of journey to getting to this point, because when you pull up the old pro football reference page, eh, you're going to find an eight sack season from a couple of years ago, then not so much in 2022 and more looked more like kind of a situational player on paper until last year where he emerges as this, you know, sack artist for the Texans. And I think if there's one concern in the Vikings signing him, it's all right. Is it a one year wonder kind of thing? And I think the underlying data says uh, maybe uh, because his pass rush win rate is not incredible. His pressure numbers are good, but they're not incredible. It really seemed that when he got pressure, he finished sacks. And it, from watching, you know, the highlight reel of him from last year, he does have like uh, good quickness and so forth. But I don't think that this is a player that's on the level of someone like Daniel Hunter. No, I think that's that's a good way to think about it for sure. And, you know, 2020 comes in, the Bill O'Brien Texans, you know, get destroyed. Romeo Cornell's here. He's not a babysitter. He wants guys who can play right away. And so he had no chance. Rookies were like verboten to that, to that whole regime. 21, he was actually probably the Texans' biggest bright spot. Um, he had the eight sacks you brought up, yeah, but also just on a down-to-down basis, he played really well, played the run really well. And when you're surrounded by the rest of the 2021 Texans, wow, you look amazing, don't you? <laughs> uh, 22, he gets hurt a little bit, gets dinged up, um, and then 23 comes back, has this big season, which you, you, know, you, you bring up a good point that a lot of the sacks – you know, they come up against quarterbacks that aren't that great. He got a lot. We got, we got some Will Levis sacks in here, folks, for sure. But uh, I do think he can at least, you know, he's, he's, he's improved enough over these two years to where you can say, okay, I think this is a guy who uh, improved his repertoire, who has enough agility, skill, uh, you know, brain power to win these, uh, these, these fights on the line of scrimmage. And I think, you know, he is going to be, a solid contributor for a while. Yeah. I mean, I I think when uh, Brian Flores is looking for players, we're going to find him getting high IQ types of guys who can do multiple things if he needs them to, uh, but is often looking for the outside linebacker type. And you mentioned that, that body type and somebody like Flores who likes to move people around and show lots of different types of looks. I think having somebody who isn't necessarily like the traditional four, three D end, can work for them. But I was just struck immediately by his personality, by how outgoing he is. I mean, you just get, you get right away the the energy from Jonathan Grenard. And I think that if you're bringing in somebody whose reputation is that they're on the Ascension and also a high IQ player, that just sounds like it would be a fit for Brian Flores. Yeah. And hey, here's another Texas tie interviewed Brian, Brian Flores <laughs> could have gone a totally different way in 2020. Uh, 122 there. Yeah. Um, I do think Grenard is, you know, he, he, by all accounts, a good, a great guy, a good locker room guy. Everybody here was pretty impressed by him. And it's just kind of about the business of which would you rather have a very good pass rusher for four years or an elite pass rusher for two and hope that works out for you. Yeah. And I think from both teams perspective, it just made the most sense for these guys. And it, it almost seems like a trade and you wouldn't trade necessarily Hunter straight up for Grenard, but you would maybe trade Hunter for two players, including Blake Cashman. Now, Blake Cashman is a guy that we're very familiar with in Minnesota, somebody who has, you know, developed uh, over the years in the NFL after being a fifth round pick came from the university of Minnesota, but last year was his big breakout year in a similar way to Jonathan Grenard. And this is both a thing that you sort of love to see a developmental player who becomes, you know, a a, a guest borderline star for the Texans, uh, but also the same sort of thing where, all right, is this a one-year thing 
or is he now a really good NFL player? And they paid him like he's now a really good NFL player. So wh- what did you think? Where, where do you stand on that? Uh, I was born on the one-year wonder camp, but it's not because I think he's a bad player. I think it's just that Cashman has had a hard time staying healthy, staying on the field. Even last year, he missed a couple of games to a hammy, I think it was. And, you know, he's he's clearly fast enough to be a three-down linebacker. Um, he's smart. He, you know, he made a lot of plays on on balls this year when they put him in good positions to do so, unlike in maybe past regimes where he wasn't in good positions to do so. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, you know, you look at what happened there, and I was like, yeah, I totally get why the Vikings would sign him. They think that they can keep him healthy. Then they could win that bet for sure. Uh, for the Texans, I mean, if you're Nick Casario, you're like, I just generated a starting linebacker out of nothing, and it cost me, you know, you know, nothing to let him walk, and maybe I got a comp pick out of it. So I, I got it for them, for their perspective as well, and they moved on and got uh, Al Shayer for for his position. So, you know, it seems like uh, with Cashman that there's some versatility there. I think now I don't know how much D'Amico Ryan's liked to use guys in the same way that Brian Flores did. Like Brian Flores moved his linebackers all over the place. The Vikings actually had a hybrid defensive player, which you never uh, actually see. You hear a lot about, but you don't usually see. And they were able to do that with uh, Josh Metellus. And when I was looking at just, you know, Blake Cashman's numbers, and it seemed like he thrived in kind of every area. Like he was good in coverage. He was good at rushing the passer if they asked him to do it. And that's another thing that I just think goes well and is really important for the Vikings defense. And they really did have to rush the passer a lot, especially in the middle of the season when Will Anderson was hurt. Like the the Texans didn't have an upper echelon guy. They kind of had to generate a lot of rush, and that kind of swayed the overall numbers, I think, away from the way Ryans would like to play, which is more straight up and, and play coverage and disguise it and, and all that. So, yeah, I think Cashman, I mean, there's definitely nothing wrong with how he played. Um, I, I wouldn't call him, like, you know, a big – banger in the trenches or anything but he can definitely handle it and it's just kind of a a bet on his health at this point like uh, that that was what concerned me just the the this was only the one year where he was like really healthy uh, so you know if you want to play special teams though nick casario always finds a special teams linebackers <laughs> Well, that's how the Vikings have found most of their safeties. So uh, I, I, I know that, that story quite well. Now, there's one more guy I want to ask you about, which is uh, Shaq Griffin. And when I first mentioned to you off the air, I was like, oh, yeah, the Vikings got a former Texan, Shaq Griffin. They're like, Shaq Griffin, he was on the team. Uh, and I noticed that he was uh, waived in the middle of the season by the Texans. And his numbers, PFF numbers, which for corners can be, you know, a little up and down, uh, maybe inconsistent. They seem fine. Uh, they seem fine with Houston over his career. They seem fine. He's been a starter in the past. Uh, what happened there with the Texans? Yeah, he was just playing uh, as a backup mainly. And Derek Stingley got hurt for with a hamstring for about six to eight weeks. He stepped in and started. Played, you know, I wouldn't say he played well, but he played about as you'd expect a backup to play. It's, there's no. He wasn't. A, he wasn't a guy who was like here's a target on my chest, please throw at me every time. And that's really all you kind of hope for when you get a veteran back up. So, I mean, I was pleased with how he played. The Texans were like, okay, Stingley's healthy. Uh, we're going to let you go because we think you can find work elsewhere because they weren't going to play him anymore because he's, you know, he didn't fit whatever roster construction they were doing at the time. I think it was about special teams probably. And then he went to Carolina for the rest of the year and uh, the Texans – brought Stingley back and Stingley played really well on the stretch. And that was yet another thing to be excited about in a weird world where as a Texans fan, I have to be excited about a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Right. When uh, Derek Stingley hitting is uh, fifth, sixth on the list of things to get uh, excited about Texans football, you know, you're doing pretty well for yourself. Griffin's numbers though are, I mean, with the Texans, And overall, actually, for last season, pretty solid. He allowed an 82 quarterback rating into his coverage, only 63% completion percentage. But I don't think this is any sort of, like, pure answer for the Vikings. This is more of depth. One-year, $6 million contract is just kind of a guy to bring in to solidify their unit a little bit more. But he has not been a starter in quite some time. I mean, really, 
not since 2021 with Jacksonville where he was okay. And then 2022 only played 300 something snaps. So even though uh, we have been campaigning for the Vikings to get a corner and they did here in Shaq Griffin, I don't think it's really like an answer. Um, so there's, there's all the hot takes that people need about Shaq Griffin joining the Vikings as the, uh, s- smaller signings start to tumble in, but I, I need to know, I need to know your take on the Vikings and what they're doing here because another Vikings Texans connection is this trade where the Texans move back. The Vikings move up to get the 23rd overall pick. I think we all know where this train is going for the Vikings, that they're going to try to trade up to the top of the draft. So obviously the Texans perspective was sure. We'll take your 2025 second round draft pick. There was probably a Jimmy Johnson draft chart where this looked good for them. And they decided to say yes, but give, give me your opinion from afar on the Vikings making this move with the Texans with likely the idea to move up. I mean, in theory, you get the right quarterback. Yeah. I mean, that's great. You, uh, you trade up two times and you get, you know, I don't know who's who, who, who's a, who's a recent bust. Oh, maybe Bryce Young. Yeah. Maybe that guy. If you trade him twice and get him, that's, that's, that's not quite as good then. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I totally understand it for the Vikings. Uh, you know, Kirk Cousins gone, you take your swings where you can get them and you got to live with the results. So I think as an organization, you know, that becomes priority one, 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 a one B one C etc. And yeah, I mean, you got to do it. You just got to hope that you land in the right spot here. Yeah, I know. And that's, what's so difficult. Um, but I think that the way that they have set this up is when we were talking about all the things that were done for CJ Stroud, they can do a lot of them for quarterback draft pick X. And one of the things that I've tried to balance, and, and maybe you've thought of this through the years is what you see in college, what all the draft analysts talk about, and also knowing that by the time they get to the NFL, how different it is and how different they can be as a player. CJ Stroud, you go back and read every draft analysis thing. Oh, he's not a playmaker. He's a, he's a pocket quarterback. He's not a playmaker. And then you watch him throwing off platform, you know, making, making some crazy throws and crazy plays that honestly, you didn't see a whole lot from him in college outside of that one game in Georgia. And then instantly that happens. So I try not to go too far into the weeds with saying, Oh, I I love this quarterback way more than that quarterback because here's his strengths and weaknesses and data. But there's also this part of me that wants more information about every guy and, and to try to figure out whether they're going to make it or not. So I I don't know how you kind of balance that going into the Stroud thing, but I kind of struggle with, how much value do I want to put on even what I saw on TV and my observations that I'm making about that player? I think Josh Allen really broke a lot of brains, mine included with that, because you come into this and you have all this analytical data that's like, oh, this guy is absolute like a clown. We could draft somebody from Washington State and he'd be better than this. What are we doing here with this Wyoming guy who can't throw any accuracy and then all of a sudden he's the, you know, just becomes a cyborg <laughs> who can throw everything downfield 70 yards on a dot and the accuracy works out. And you're like, oh, well, I guess that's what they were thinking. They were just, yeah, a little, a little projection there. So, yeah, it, it's uh, with Stroud in particular, like last year I had him above uh, Bryce Young. Like I, that, I was very happy that that pick worked out the way it was before it happened. Um, and I kind of leaned more on, okay, so – down and down, sure, but what are the what are what are my upper echelon traits here? What am I banking on? And I thought that Stroud, even if he didn't develop the way that he did, if he you know to rem- if he if all the Ohio State sack criticisms were true, if he couldn't move in the pocket, does can he still have something to fall back on? Yeah, he has got that accuracy. That accuracy was. Great. Um, it was probably the best I'd seen in a couple of years out of somebody coming out. So, you know, you kind of have to look at it in probability buckets. Like if this guy is poor, is he, you know, a washout where you don't want anything to do with him? Or is he like Kirk Cousins? Is he Derek Carr? Somebody like that where you at least get somewhere. And yeah, I think 
the, the, that's the way I approach these quarterbacks now is more based on the probability buckets and the Vikings have some interesting buckets to aim for now. No, they will certainly do. I also think of it as what does the guy do exceptionally well? And this is where my struggle comes in with JJ McCarthy. When you ask people about McCarthy and you're like, tell me the thing that he does super, super well. And they will say, well, the way his mind works. And like, oh, okay. Well, that's really hard to project to the NFL because how your mind works in college is going to have to be a hell of a lot faster when it comes to the NFL. When you tell me about Drake May and I watch him, it's very easy to spot the superpower. It's the cannon. Like It's like, oh, there it is. Okay. He just whipped that ball 25 yards down the field on a dig route and hit the guy right on the money. So that's what I'm looking for. And I think with Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, that is the instructive part, which is what is your cheat code? What is it that makes you potentially special? And then you have to fix the other stuff and that's on you. Like if Patrick Mahomes didn't fix his footwork, he wouldn't have been good or at least this good. And if Josh Allen didn't fix his accuracy, he wouldn't have been either. And a lot of that comes down to, does the guy have the work ethic, the heart, the dedication, the want to, how do you know that? I think that McCarthy is probably the one that you could say most clearly has been on a path since high school to be an NFL quarterback and is going to put in the work and so forth. But is he ever going to develop a skill where you go, all right, this guy can't be denied. You know, it's, it's the fourth quarter or whatever. You got to have somebody go win you a football game. Can he not be denied? Because that is what held up Kirk Cousins is that he never had that. And uh, Alex Smith never had that. And, you know, the, those sort of quarterbacks that only take you so far. So what is what is your feeling on, on this draft class, by the way? Like, how, how are you viewing that whole thing? Well, yeah, I think I think if you get if the Vikings do get wind up trading up, they're going to have a choice between McCarthy or May, and I'm with you on that. I think May is probably the better selection there. I understand kind of where they built McCarthy. Like I, I like I try to follow the people who, even if I don't agree with them, I'm like, okay, where are they coming from with this guy? And I think <laughs> what 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 really worries me about it is you kind of get some of the same Bryce Youngisms in there, like. like oh, well, you know, he was scrambled really far to make this play, and this was a big play in this game. I'm like, okay, how's that going to work in the NFL when the guys are much faster and much bigger, the pockets are much tighter, and also when you do escape, you better get it out in a hurry or else you're going to go down in a hurry too. (laughs) So, yeah, the, the McCarthy thing worries me quite a bit, but... Also, as with the Allen thing, um, I try to approach it with, okay, is there a chance that I am wrong? Absolutely. I don't, I don't pay the same level of attention to these guys that NFL GMs do. I don't know their personality scouting reports, all that stuff. I don't know his S2 scores. Ooh, ooh, very topical. And yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm open to being wrong, but I definitely would see May as a better prospect than McCarthy. Or his fake leaked s2 scores we don't really know uh exactly what oh, happened yes. there <laughs> everybody just lighting up to make the s2 people look bad as if we knew who they were for the last <laughs> five years or something <laughs> you know by the way with that and uh they had a bunch of excuses and stuff uh for for that happening after they themselves touted that test as we'll find the great quarterbacks with our s2 test and then when it doesn't hit on something it was like uh fake and wrong and we flagged it and we have got a lot of excuses but really mr uh, uh s2 test man nothing is ever going to tell us with a hundred percent certainty who's going to work out in the nfl and i used to call it draft nihilism and now i, I maybe i should call it like draft humility is just to be able to admit that and that's the same thing with mccarthy is that throughout this entire thing I've brought up a lot of concerns that I have, but you could also bring up a lot of concerns with every quarterback who's become good all the way through. And I I guess I just have to say, I'm going to lean on who they think is the guy that they're going to take. I mean, if they're trading up to four, which this hasn't happened yet. So I don't know if that's where they're going. If they trade up to four, that means they trust McCarthy enough to be their franchise quarterback. That means they've seen something that their staff has seen something that they have talked to him, that they have an understanding of what he can learn and how fast he can come along. 
that I just don't have. So I can have my questions, but if it does, if, if, if they take them, how could I ever be against it knowing the history of this and how difficult it is to pick out which guys are going to work? Yeah, it's, it's really weird, especially when you have people in your front office who you don't actually trust. <laughs> but that, that, that's, that's coming from, from the text and stuff like, okay, yeah, Ross Blacklock in the second round. Who thought that was a good idea? And now I'm supposed to trust him to pick a quarterback, like that sort of thing. And, and yeah, Davis Mills did not work out very well. Nico Collins didn't look like he'd be working out very well. And then it becomes apparent to me before this year's draft that the Texans would prefer to have Bryce Young over CJ Stroud if they had the choice. Sometimes it's just about being lucky. Just, just, you know, you pick the right guy at the right time. That person is more than whatever the accumulation of your data is. And it's funny to think about because in a way we all kind of live lives where we're like, I can do this one thing that would be the best for me, or I can put it off and do some bullshit. <laughs> like we all are faced with that every day in, in some form. Maybe it's even as simple as I can go to sleep and get an extra two hours and be ready for tomorrow where I can have this candy bar. And you never know who's going to pick what or when that's going to turn. And if the NFL understood everything to that level, picking quarterbacks would be easy, but that's why they pay all these coaches and GMs so much money is to make sure that they got the best chance of hitting that pick. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure if I am completely following the analogy, but when people, when quarterbacks come into a new environment though, Mm -hmm. it's so much different that how do you know how they're going to handle it? And you really can't know that. And you could take a guy that you think is going to be really, really great with the way that he handles it. And then immediately starts to, to melt. Like I would have, I mean, you know, Kenny Pickett was never good enough. That's just kind of a reality, but I guess I wouldn't have thought that Kenny Pickett, the minute they traded for Russell Wilson would have at least by reports sort of like demanded out and thrown the fit or whatever. And like uh, Kenny Pickett, really? I would have <laughs> thought that guy would have been well-grounded. And uh, I'll tell you like a, a story that's not exactly related, but still pro sports. There was a, um, a WNBA draft pick who came from one of the smallest universities. It was in Buffalo and she didn't make her team right away, which happens all the time. They have very few teams. And uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of times players get cut and they're brought back when someone gets injured. And this player went on the internet and threw an absolute hissy fit acting like she had been the, the biggest superstar in the league. And you're like, I would have never expected that from some small school type of player who should have been thankful to be there. But the minute she sort of got a taste of attention, WNBA draft pick changed. And that can happen with anybody in the NFL. And that's where, you know, someone like CJ Stroud, what I really love about CJ Stroud that has come about, I think to the public more, but maybe he was always this way. This guy is 22 going on 34. I mean, it just, he comes across as so incredibly calm and mature. And he was on like college game day talking with those guys. And you know, they're always trying to get people to joke and say, you know, silly stuff that'll go viral, whatever. And, and, and he just, he was just so calm talking through that, breaking down games like he had prepared and everything. I was like, man, every time I see this guy, press conferences, interviews, he just has such incredible maturity you don't know that that's going to be somebody when they come out of college. And that's, what's really amazed me about him. Yeah. I was really drawn, especially by when Nate Tice got to interview him at Super Bowl and go over those three or four plays or whatever it was. And just like all the things he's looking at, all the, all the, the, the pre-snap recognition that comes from all the work that you put in before that. And that's kind of what I was trying to get at, you know, bring up candy bars and stuff. Like you got to trust these guys, it's it's one thing where you know what you want to elevate on your on your draft board like okay this guy can sit down at the board drop the play and tell you everything about it that's great is he actually going to do that in the nfl now that you've seen that he can you know draw it up that's an open question that's totally it could go either way and is he going to know enough about the traits of the guys he's playing that could go either way 
it's really, you know, the Texans tried to create this like culture thing from 21 and 22, where they're talking about, okay, we need to make sure everybody's working their hardest, working their best every hour of every day. And yeah, you can say that and you can aspire to that, but you can't watch people 24 seven. You don't know what CJ Stroud does when he goes home. You don't know what Davis Mills does when he goes home. And that's kind of also what builds in how good you become. Yeah. And Kirk Cousins has talked about this before of just how much you have to live 365 being a quarterback. It's not just a position. It's not just a job. It's an entire existence and it's an entire lifestyle that you have to live. And if you're not willing to completely buy into that, uh, then you're going to struggle. And I, and I do think that tying this back into the Vikings, if McCarthy's their guy, he is the one I think you'd be most confident that that is him. Like it just strikes me as being that guy, like as someone who has wanted to go to IMG Academy or something and has kind of come up through this and he's gotten better and better as he's gone along at Michigan. And he, if you can get along with Jim Harbaugh really well, then I think you've got to be an extreme football guy. And so I think if he's living and breathing that sort of quarterback existence, that he's got a good chance to elevate beyond what I think is actually there because it is about resolving the touch on the fastball for him. It is about, you know, get it. I think getting the ball out sometimes a little bit quicker than he did, uh, or at least on time on like comeback routes and stuff like that. So there's a lot of details to be worked out, but he just strikes me as that guy. That doesn't mean he will be, but I think that if you're a team and you sit down with him and you listen to him talk, he really sort of exudes, I, I'm like that quarterback type of guy. It doesn't guarantee anything. It's just if I'm trying to make that case for McCarthy, I think he presents that extremely well, and that's one of the things that teams could buy into him. Yeah, I think if he does get picked high, if he does get picked in the top ten, for sure we'll get some some articles all around around that. And I'm not even sure that it actually matters. <laughs> you know, like like it, it, to some extent, you you when you character study and then you build narrative, they just become one and the same almost like if three years from now, you know, he takes a meditation trip and decides, you know what, I'm going to become Jim McMahon. Like that's, that's anything can happen in the NFL. Anybody you study character wise can become a different person with one or two changes. And Sometimes things just random things happen. John Mechie got cancer, you know, or leukemia, I should say. And yeah, like he could have been, you know, one of the best receivers in that class. I don't think we'll ever know anymore. Like it's, it, it all becomes a little bit random at some point. Well, I mean, we know that here, Teddy Bridgewater and uh, the knee yeah, situation, man. just as he's ascending. Yeah. To be that speaking, speaking I mean, that's... Texans Vikings uh, intersections there. Oh, I wanted some Teddy so bad in 2014. And they were on the route. And that was the thing about Teddy is that he came across sort of that way, like that leadership and, and how he handled himself was his, one of his top traits. And that all came to fruition very quickly and became one of his best things. And, you know, there's also, gosh, there's so many pitfalls and there's so many unpredictable things like Teddy Bridgewater connected with that locker room super well. And even though the coaches weren't necessarily the best at the time, sort of fought through that and, you know, connected with Mike Zimmer as a head coach, you just don't know how those personalities are going to work out. The other thing with McCarthy on the other side of the coin is that Drake may has been punched in the face in college because his team is bad. And so he's had to battle and he's had to fight. Even Caleb Williams, you could say has been through it and has already started to feel the NFL style criticism where JJ McCarthy has never lost. And if you, you start your career two and six or something like welcome to the NFL, my friend, where you can get your tail or whooped in this league that has never happened to him before when his team, <laughs> When his team's in the national championship, he's just handing off and winning the game. And it's like, the guy has always won, so how will he deal with failure? If he doesn't win the job out of training camp, how will he deal with that? Like, there's all these questions that have to be answered that I think makes it fascinating, but also frustrating because I want to have a take. I want your take. I want everybody's take. But we all have to admit at the end of the day that we're not really quite sure. But you know what I am sure of, Rivers? Is that the Vikings hired Josh McCown. All right, let's go. 
Your cousin, Josh McCown, you look just like him. Not actually my uh, cousin, but we'll go with it. <laughs> no, uh, no relation whatsoever. And you look absolutely nothing like him. Uh, and uh, I would suggest uh, that you might be a tad slower, less athletic. If people have seen the Josh McCown playing basketball highlights, oh my gosh, uh, what an athlete. I but, don't have, I don't have uh, a jean jacket either. Uh, no. And, uh, you don't do this with your hair. You don't have hair that you could do this with. Nope. Not at all. But, uh, for years we have joked around that you're a journeyman quarterback because of Luke and uh, Josh McCown, and you have such a backup quarterback name. What a great moment for the Vikings to hire Josh McCown. And I actually think uh, we should mention one time Houston Texans head coach candidate, Josh McCown is what we should mention as well. So I feel you are obligated, even if you have absolutely no opinion on this whatsoever, since he was a Texan, since you are distantly somehow related to him, I'm sure your opinion on the Vikings hiring Josh McCown. He also played for the Texans for half a season. He did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure yeah. to throw that in there because Jack Easterby tried to make him the head coach based on partially that half season of, of him sitting there. So yeah. Um, my opinion on Josh McCown, I think Josh McCown seems like a bright guy from afar. I, you know, I, I don't know deeply what he believes in. I don't know kind of, you know, his coaching style or anything because I didn't watch him coach here. He coached in Carolina last year, right? So, I mean, I think he definitely deserves a chance to be a QB coach and grow from that. And yeah, other than that, I don't have deep hot takes about this. I just think, you know, it's, it's a guy who you're hoping develops into even more. And, you know, he's definitely got all the tools to become more than, than he was last year. I think you did well with that because there's no way you could have an opinion on the Vikings hiring Josh McCown. And I would never ask you if that hadn't been a long time joke with us, but uh, it is cool though. I think it, it does. It does help somebody who's been through what he's been through, who has probably worked with, I don't know, a dozen young quarterbacks at this point of all different kinds throughout his career. And that was a major part of his value at the same time he was in Carolina. So nobody's a, a miracle worker, I guess, but uh, rivers, I'm really glad um, that we could get together, man. I, uh, I know that uh, you are on daddy duty these days, so your NFL writing uh, is a little bit less, but your child will grow. Your NFL writing will come back. And uh, you know that I'm a huge fan of having you on the show and uh, of uh, your writing as well. So you deserve to write about good quarterback play, and I'm looking forward to more of that in the future. So thanks for coming on, man. I'm, I'm glad we could get together. We also need to bring up before I go, Texans, Vikings, Connections, Sage Rosenfels. That's all. Sage Rosenfels, good friend of mine, great guy, one of the best journeyman quarterbacks ever. Sage Rosenfels. Ended on Sage Rosenfels. Brett, That's all that matters. Brett Far- yeah, Brett Favre's backup, 2009. Yep. So yeah. the, the uh, connections run ever so mildly deep. <laughs> Thanks, Rivers. Thanks a lot. <laughs>